You know, the thing that this is a collective society is completely bullshit. Chinese are very independent unless somebody's watching them and they pretend to be collective. So I've always gotten along. That's the voice of Jim McGregor, my guest on this episode of Inside Asia. I'm Steve Stein, and this is Inside Asia. Conversations with Asia's leading movers, shakers, thinkers, and provocateurs. Before I go to the interview, I have a confession. When we started doing this podcast, I put together a list of people I knew I wanted to interview, and Jim topped that list. What this show is about is not just people who know Asia, but people who are also great storytellers. Voices that draw you in, the ones you can't help but want to listen to. Jim McGregor, author, China expert, and senior corporate advisor, is that person. He's deeply knowledgeable, but he's also an absolute pleasure to talk to. As my listeners know, I usually begin by asking guests what first brought them to this part of the world. But in this instance, I did something a little different. On the evening I met with Jim, it was rush hour in the Chinese capital. I sat in traffic for more than an hour. That's the time it took to travel just eight kilometers. I might have walked if not for the freezing temperatures and horrific air quality. I took that time in the back of the taxi to scan McGregor's bio on Wikipedia. I first met Jim in 1991, and I never asked him how a lad from the Midwest found himself in Asia. The Wikipedia entry read as follows. James McGregor was born in Duluth, Minnesota, one of nine children. After graduating from high school, he was asked by a career counselor if he enjoyed camping, and when he answered yes, was encouraged to enlist as a foot soldier in the U.S. Army. He was promptly sent to Vietnam, where he was wounded by a North Vietnamese IED while on combat patrol and was awarded a Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. According to reports of the incident, the booby trap was actually triggered by a bomb-detecting dog who apparently was more agile than McGregor and survived the detonation unharmed. His experience in Vietnam sparked his interest in Asia and led him to become a journalist. I caught up with Jim in the executive lounge of the Marriott Hotel Northeast, one of the first global hotels in the capital of Beijing and just a stone's throw from the U.S. Embassy. We sat in a darkened corner of the lounge drinking scotch. I started by asking Jim if any of this was true. Oh, my God. I haven't looked at Wikipedia in a long time. I don't know who wrote that. Well, it's pretty it, it's semi true. The true story is I got expelled from high school at a Catholic school and they had all these rules. And so I thought if I broke, you know, I'd see how many I could break. And I broke enough. So they kicked me out. And then I uh, finished high school, hang out in the parking lot of a public school. But that opened my, you know, then I decided, well, I want to go see the world. I always, from when I was a little kid, I had maps from National Geographic on my walls of, you know, I always wanted to see the world. I remember watching TV at night and seeing these foreign correspondents. So anyhow, when I got when I did get out of high school, um, I decided I'd join the army and go see the world. And it wasn't a counselor. I took the army intelligence test, and it was like you like the outdoors. Yep, you like camping. Yep. Well, they put me in the infantry because you go in at seventeen, you just sign in for two years, and then you go where you know wherever they assign you. I also volunteered for Vietnam. My parents did not know that. It wasn't out of any sense of patriotism or anything. By that time, everybody's going to Canada. This is 1971. You know, your brain's not fully formed when you're 17. Um, I decided that I wanted to see what a war was like. So then I landed after infantry school and all that. I landed in Vietnam, and I'm going, um, that was not a good idea. <laughs> At what point did it dawn on you that maybe I made the wrong choice and Canada was looking pretty good? Well, actually, when I, when I, when I arrived in Vietnam, we arrived in Da Nang, and we were replacing people in a squad that had that had a number of people been killed and then they took us to this Quonset hut and they had these people show us all the different ways people could kill you and then, then they had these sappers these were vietnamese who could crawl through concertina wire and get through and you know these were people who had been captured and were now training american gis and i just remember watching this and then going outside and sitting there and looking and watching seeing these people with water buffaloes and conical hats out in the field and, and you know tears come in my eyes going this was i've made some bad decisions in life this is i think this is the top one so far and and so is it true that you actually were uh, you were injured and you, and you were then relieved of duty and came back to the united states 
Uh, yeah, I was infantry, and you know, also, um, I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, where it was, you know, I mean, a minority was, you know, a Norwegian of mixed blood or something, and anybody that's from any kind of an elite family, it's got a, a deferment for college. So it was me and inner city blacks. My entire squad was inner city black guys. And I got along with them great because I can talk shit, you know, and they, they liked me right away. But I, I, I became the machine gunner because I said, I want, I want control of that, of that thing. Um, where I got wounded was, you know, we'd go out on these missions and we, 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 this was a mission where we were supposed to find a bunker complex. Um, and we did have a booby track dog. And that dog was, um, uh, I apparently set it off. And we're just walking along and things blow up and I go flying back and I, you know, my leg's bleeding, and the guy behind me's got it in the head and all of this. And anyhow, yeah, my knee got kind of messed up a little bit. And, and yeah, yeah, so this, so I really, I didn't know this was true. Honestly, I, I thought you just made this up, you know, in, 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 the, in the age of fake news. I thought maybe you were just ahead of the curve, but I'm wrong. No, exactly. But uh, I haven't had a dog since. <laughs> <laughs> so, so despite this, you know, experience in this time in Vietnam, you went back, um, you, you then became infatuated with China. And it was around 1985, if I understand correctly, that you came and, and backpacked through China at a time that was opening up and saw some of the some of the countryside. Can you tell us a little bit about those experiences and some of the stories from that time? Sure. Well, what happened is um, Vietnam led to me being a journalist because it looked like a job with no adult supervision. And, you know, I saw these journalists in Vietnam and, they, and you could go out and do interesting things. And so when we had journalists on missions with us, so I went back and became a journalist and I went and covered a, a, basically a police beat in L.A. going from murder to murder. And then I went to Washington. I covered Congress. Wasn't that different on many days. And then I, um, but I kept my eye on Asia. I used to read the Far East Economic Review cover to cover, and I could see the rise of China. So I decided that I would come to China and look around. So in 85, I went with my sister, who was uh, working in refugee camps in Thailand at the time. And um, we backpacked around China, had no clue, and I didn't speak the language. But um, we went, God, we were in Beijing, Shanghai. Uh, Xi'an, Kunming, Guangzhou, I don't remember. We were all over the country, but you could feel the energy of the people and their desire to learn, their desire to learn about the outside world and be somebody. And I just thought this would be the place happening in my lifetime. And, and that's so you turned around within what period of time and decided to come back? Well, you went to Taiwan at that point, didn't you? <laughs> well, what I did is I, on the way flying back to the U.S. from China, I went through the Taipei airport. I looked out the window and I thought, shit, this place looks pretty modern. So I went back and, and uh, convinced my long-suffering wife that um, why don't we get rid of everything we own and move to Taiwan and learn Mandarin. And uh, I don't know why the hell she did it. I mean, she's from a very blue-collar family in Duluth, Minnesota. And, you know, this is pretty far out of the purview what she would do. And so in 87, we got rid of everything we owned, two suitcases each, landed in Taipei, went to the YWCA and started teaching English. And um, then within a few months, the Wall Street Journal hired me because on my way out of the U.S., I stopped and saw a few editors. And in fact, I got in to see Norm Perlstein, who was the editor of the Wall Street Journal, because my bureau chief in Washington at the time was his college roommate. Yeah. So I went and saw Norm and I said, hey, Norm, I'm gonna, you're going to send me to China in a couple of years. I'm going to Taiwan to learn Mandarin. And I was in Taiwan just a few months and I got a call from uh, Barry Wayne, the editor of the Asian Wall Street Journal. He said, Norm Perlstein called me and he said, uh, our opening for Taiwan, you're the right guy. You want a job. And Taiwan at that time was kind of a, a, a way station for people who were waiting for China to open up. A, a lot of, uh, you know, China scholars today are the ones who are sitting in Taiwan, observing the mainland from the island just across the straits. A lot of people who are in China today were, were actually kind of got to know each other. So there's a network of people from that Taiwan period who are still here or, or have been working through year and years past. Is that right? Oh, yeah. A lot of the journalists, I mean, Andy Brown, you know, I met him in 87. We're still very close friends. We live 15 minutes away from each other in Shanghai. Paul Mooney, I met, I met Paul Mooney when he was, um, we went to a, an event for the government where they were driving uh, steamrollers over um, pirated, uh, uh, there must have been eight track tapes in those days, I can't remember. Yeah, there's a whole group of people and actually we were so lucky because we covered the democracy movement there. You know, we knew Chen Shui Bien when he's a protester in the street. Um, and it was a small place. And I actually think Paul Mooney named the Democratic Progressive Party's English name. I think Joey Wren called him and said, uh, 
Minjindang, some showing one. And I think Paul told him what it was, and it was a lot of fun. It was it was fun. But actually, what I got to know is I got to know Chinese culture and what is Chinese and what is communist, because it somewhat overlaps. I was able to see it because Taiwan is is a very Chinese place. So then coming here, I was able to discern what what was the party and the communist communist influence and what was really Chinese. And I came here in '90, right after Tiananmen, a year after Tiananmen. You know, it was also the Gulf War had started, and no cell phones, no internet. Your editors couldn't find you, so I was able to travel all over the country and really get to know the place because I had the whole country to myself. I was the only reporter for the Wall Street Journal, and there wasn't a hell of a demand for news because of the Gulf War. So I traveled around, was able to do really in-depth stories and really kind of get to know the place. It was. I, I dread that these poor journalists today with Twitter and all this. They sit at their desks and they're, you know, they're tweeting and they're going on camera. I, you know, I could disappear. The editors would call, and um, you know, I say, can't hear you, you know. <laughs> so, it, so you know, if if you look back at that time when you were traveling through China and and then looking, you know, flash forward. Did you have any inkling of what China was going to become? Were there any indications from your personal stories or the encounters that China could be that become this world power that it's becoming today? God, you know, I ask myself that question all the time, and if I had a memory, I'd be dangerous. Um, I, I knew it was going to move ahead. You definitely knew it was going to move ahead. You just didn't know it would move ahead at light, lightning speed. It has. But you would. Everybody you met had a plan, or an, uh, an opera, you know, They were looking for doing some kind of business. Everybody I met wanted to. I'd, I'd go. You know, when I was a Wall Street Journal, 1990, 91, I'd go out to some city. The party secretary would meet with me, and he would say, um, he'd "Give me the lecture of the day, whether it was peaceful evolution or one China policy with Taiwan." And then he'd get that done, and he'd say, "Okay, you're the Wall Street Journal. I need investment. How do we work together to get it?" investment yeah. or I'd meet um, can I tell a little real quick story oh, please please yeah. okay so I had a a, a lady from our um, Japan office had gotten married and she came here for her honeymoon an editor and so I had dinner with them and they were very nice people and then I get this call because her husband was carrying her down coal hill behind the forbidden city and running he tripped, she flew over his shoulder and, and hit her head on a rock and went into convulsions. So some fabulous, nice Chinese people grabbed, grabbed her, did pressure points, threw her in a cab, took her to this hospital in western Beijing. They call, I get a call, and, and so I go out to this, and the hospital is just this tiny little, very rudimentary place. So I grab her and I take him over to uh, the uh, Shodu Hospital, which was a hospital originally built by the Rockefellers, carrying her around the hospital, you know, pulling an old Beijing man off the extra machine, putting this three-wheeled bicycle, um, you know, thing and putting her on. And, and um, you know, those kind of ad adventures and those kind of things. And, and um, But to get to the story then, a few months later, the guy who helped her, um, that day comes to my office at Dow Jones and he wants to talk to me and I go out and greet him and thank him and he, then he sits down and he's got his buddy with him and they, they, they want to pitch a business to me. So they have a machine that creates oxygen and so they plug this machine in and this guy takes these two tubes and puts them in his nose and he starts explaining how this thing creates oxygen. Well, these tubes are in his nose. And this is, I mean, this is, you know, some guy saw an entrepreneurial opportunity the first time he's met a foreigner. And they come in and try it. And that was the spirit of China. Give it a damn shot. Yeah. And that's just a fantastic telling of what it used to be. And you saw this energy, right? You saw people on the streets all the time thinking of, as the door opens, what's my opportunity? Closed for 35, 40 years under communism. You know, what could we do and how we could how we, could we contribute and actually make good? I mean, there must be thousands of stories like that that you've seen through the years. You know, at, at one point, there was we talked about restaurants and the opening of restaurants. And one of my favorite articles that you wrote in the early 1990s were about the rat restaurant uh, down in, in some, I think it was in Guangzhou or Guangzhou. Yeah, Guangzhou. Can, can you tell us a little bit about coming upon that restaurant and some of the experiences there? Because that's a, a great telling of entrepreneurship uh, meets, meets China. <laughs> well, actually, Andy Brown and I went down there together. We had heard about this place. So we go to this restaurant 
and it is like it's blonde wood i mean this is guangzhou which was ahead of everybody else so it's like this semi-fancy blonde wood restaurant um because those days you go to a duck restaurant in beijing and there was duck bones on the floor where everybody spit them out and you crunched your way into your chair but this was kind of fancy and so the boss comes over and starts you know telling us about descriptions of all the all, all you know flambe this whatever all the descriptions of the various dishes we go into the kitchen it looks like dante's inferno with these these flames and these 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 rats and he's explaining that these rats are are, are, are free-range rats that they get them by having electric wires across the fields and they just stun them and um, that these are people who lived in the countryside and they they grew up on this kind of food and they like it so Andy Brown and I just start drinking a lot of beer um, to deal with this and you eat this stuff and I think I described it as like um, I don't know, chicken wrapped in Crisco or or something. (laughs) But actually, we got pretty buzzed and we walked away and they said, one of the things that you eat it in the winter because it makes you warm. And actually, we were, it did, it makes you sweat. (laughs) With no, it wasn't even spicy. So anyhow, I wrote this article about this this rat restaurant. It was the old A-head on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And uh, it got faxed up to the space shuttle because they had rat experiments going on. You're making that up. No, no, that actually happened. (laughs) Actually, this is my this is my journalism legacy. I yeah. mean, I put people in jail. I had police protection on some of the investigative stuff I did. But I go to the Wall Street Journal yeah. day. They recognize. They remember me as the rat guy. <laughs> well, yeah, I brought it up, right? I mean, you've done some amazing, uh, most amazing political economic stories in China. Yet everyone talks about Jim McGregor and the rat story. And it's not. It's it's your legacy, but it also is is a telling about China and its attempt to kind of you know be unique in a thousand, a million different ways. Yeah. Well, the story I miss is Andy Brown and I went down to. Um, visit Dr. Long in Wuhan, who is the penis doctor. We probably, I don't know if you want to get into that. but yeah, absolutely, Jim. Let's go for that one. <laughs> We've got time. Go ahead. Okay, well, we heard about this Dr. Long in Wuhan who did, um, the, who was the penis doctor. So Andy Brown and I go down there to meet him. We go to his penis part of the hospital. And um, this guy took basically micro penises and turned them into Louisville sluggers. And, <laughs> So he started out with a kid who got his his penis bit off by a pig because he had split pants in a village. So we go now in. Now, it's split, split, split pants. You may need to explain that to well, American I mean, listeners. In, I mean, in, in old China or in villages, the kids just wear pants that split at the bottom so they can do their business without having to take their pants off. Yeah, no, no diapers. No diapers. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, back to the back to the penis. So anyhow, so Doctor Long takes us around the hospital, and he'll you know he'll go up to some big guy with his mom walking down the hall, and he'll tell him to drop his pants and show us his penis. And so anyhow, then we go into our interview. So it's Doctor Long and two assistants in white coats, and Andy and I, who are like a couple of schoolboys, right? And so he brings out photo albums, dicks I have built. So he's got this, uh, you know, he shows us the early models and it's basically, he took, he took ribs and, and whatever muscles and he built like Louisville sluggers. And then, you know, that wasn't, I mean, that's kind of hard to carry around. And so then, but then he, he progressed to how he modified his science. But then after the first photo album, it's time for a break. Dr. Long's assistant comes in with a bowl of bananas. (laughs) You're joking. I shit you not. <laughs> and so Andy, they, they had us eat bananas, and we're all eating a banana, and then we're looking at the second photo album. The second photo album is where he kind of figured out that, um, I don't know how much detail you want, but that the penis is like a, a sailboat uh, mast, and if you unmoor it from the deck of the the deck of the boat it can stick out yeah, i knew that everyone knows that jim yeah. well that's what he started yeah. doing he just yeah. started cutting off the roots or whatever and anyhow um he became a uh, it, you know just became this miracle cure um <laughs> a cure for micro dick right <laughs> which is which a lot of people don't know is you know it's a serious issue right i mean worldwide so this this is something that, that did it go global Actually, it did because years later, Esquire magazine, um, there's a doctor in Beverly Hills who has a cure for micro dick, and it is this special cure that came out of China. So is this the case of U.S. actually stealing Chinese IP? I mean, as, as opposed to everyone always blaming, you know, I mean, this is, this is a clear case of, of Beverly Hills exploiting, you know, Chinese innovation. 
Well, no, I think it was a technology transfer that they may not have paid for. But anyhow, I never wrote the story because then Andy and I will go to the Wuhan airport, which in those days is like a garage. And there is um, it's fogged in all the time. And so we're stuck there for like two or three days because they have you come in the morning, you'd wait. No planes come in. If one came in, there's a scrum grabbing on there. So Andy and I, again, we're, we're getting into a theme here. We're drinking a few beers and we're and so Andy's writing a story for Reuters and I'm contributing and we're laughing and bullshitting and putting this thing together. So then I get back, finally get back to Beijing and I call my editor, Leela Scott, and say, hey, I got a great story about this dick doctor. And, and he goes, um, I just read it and I just read it on Reuters. You can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> he beat you to the punch. <laughs> How did that feel? Did that, and the, the friendship lasted despite that. Yeah, yeah, yeah we've, we've endured. <laughs> <laughs> so the, these were the, 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 the prime days of journalism. So I, I and in fact, let's talk a little bit later about media and the evolution of media. But, you know, if I can, I don't know if this is, is, is pressing it. You've had a love-hate relationship for China for many, many years. I mean, you, you're enamored by the culture, by the people. I mean, you're one of the great storytellers. Um, you, 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 you give people enormous amounts of time and credibility, yet there are frustrations that keep percolating up through the, through the system, whether it's the bureaucracy or the politics or just the advancement of the economy itself. I mean, how do you, how do you reckon with that? And, and, you know, here you are still, so you're holding in there as, as opposed to being back to, uh, you know, your, your lake house place where you spend uh, three months every summer deeply contemplating, why am I living and going to China? But what are your thoughts so many years later? It doesn't, it's, has, it, has it lost some of the charm and appeal that it had in the earlier days? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Not really, because I'm, I'm not emotional about China. You know, I'm not one of these people that studied Tang Dynasty poetry in college and came here, you know, thinking that the eight immortals would visit my kitchen and talk to me or whatever. I, I came here just, I came here because, I, you know, I'm a junkie for figuring things out, and you're constantly figuring things out here. I really have a lot of respect for the people. I like the Chinese people. They laugh at my jokes. You know, they, we, they, Chinese people are a lot like Americans. They're, they're independent. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're funny. They, they have a sense of humor. Um, they don't like anybody telling them what to do. You know, the thing that this is a collective society is completely bullshit. Chinese are very independent unless somebody's watching and they pretend to be collective. So I've always gotten along. When I criticize China, I'm criticizing the government, but I don't do it out of, you know, I, I'm not emotional, but I'm just fact based as I would criticize any government that's not doing well enough for its people. I know a lot of people in government. I got a lot of friends in government. We all deserve better governments than we have, whether it's a democracy or it's this place. But, um, you know, it's hard to argue with success here. You know, this may sound kind of crass, but um, the longer I'm here, the more I try to analyze China without getting uh, clouded by fairness, justice, or truth. And, and that may sound weird, but um, those are such core values for the West that if you look through that lens, you'll never figure out what's going on here because they're not looking through that lens. They're just very practical on what they got to get done, and they'll... It's not like they're terrible people, but they'll crush anybody that gets in their way uh, of this system. Is that, is that born of just coming up through a communist system? Is that more, uh, you know, culturally Chinese? What, what is their lens? I think it's a combination of, um, I think it's um, a combination of Chinese culture that's been distorted by uh, a party system that is um, just is in, is incapable of admitting mistakes and incapable of honesty. Um, you know, if the party here would just kind of say, "Hey, look, we, you know, it's been, you know, it's it's been a few good decades. We've had some bad ones and some good ones, but look what we've done for you. Let's move on." Instead, they have to pretend that everything's been great and crush anybody that will be a revisionist in history, is what they call it. It's really too bad because the Chinese people are ahead of that. It's harder and harder. I mean, given the political situation in America today, it's really harder and harder to be all that critical because you can walk down the street here and it's safe. People are moving ahead. And the thing about this government is when you pick yourself, you better perform. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get in the way of this system, you're going to be crushed. But this is an authoritarian regime that runs scared of its own citizens because they've had such exponential growth for so many years. In the last 20 years, Chinese kids growing up five years apart are growing up in a different China. So generations last five, lasted five years. Mm -hmm. So they have so many expectations. You know, it's like they've gone from they've gone from you know 
poverty to Jack Ma. And so these kids have all these expectations. So the government runs scared of that. We're, we're focused on, you know, trying to, we think everybody should, can be made just like us. Yeah. Look, I was in Vietnam. I'm a patriot. I believe in American values, and I think we should defend them, and I think we should do what we can around the world. But we still, we also have this missionary complex where we think we can change everybody and make them just like us. And um, I hope we've learned our lesson that you can't do that. So how do you reconcile the two? Because whether you like it or not, the U.S. and China are on a path, right? And uh, under this new administration in the U.S., it's a big question mark as to what U.S.-China policy is going to look like and whether or not the rattling of sabers is actually going to turn into issues that are going to impact, negatively impact the relationship. What do you think? Oh, it's so complicated because, you know, Chinese business and American business get along when they're allowed to do business, when it's not state-owned enterprise and it's not really political. Chinese and American kids get along. There's, what, 350,000 Chinese in American universities. And, you know, my kids grew up here. And, and I can't tell you how many people have worked for me over the years, you know, hundreds, if not well over a thousand, who are some scattered around America, whatever. They're like family. You know, people get along. The, 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 the DNA of the political cultures of the two places is very different. And that's what everybody gets hung up on. And also our politicians use the other as a foil. You know, they have a military industrial complex here. To have a military industrial complex that, you, that, that's, that is robust, you need a big enemy. And so, you know, I think Kissinger said this, you know, you're going to have a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you treat somebody like an enemy, they become an enemy. And I think we've kind of, you know, we're headed down that road way, way too much. The people are way ahead of us in not feeling like that. But the two governments are that way. And they, I mean, they, they owe it to their people to stop this shit. This is Steve Stein, and you're listening to Inside Asia, a conversation with Asia's leading movers, shakers, thinkers, and provocateurs. My guest this episode is Jim McGregor, China expert and senior corporate advisor. More after the break. This is Steve Stein, and this is Inside Asia. I'm talking with Jim McGregor, and in this next exchange, we talk about some of the ways in which rampant nationalism on both sides of the China-American divide is adversely affecting trade relations. A couple of points first to give a little context. During our discussion, I make reference to a number of companies, including Alibaba and Huawei. For listeners who haven't heard of these companies, they represent just two of a litany of up-and-coming Chinese multinationals bent on rewriting the book on global commerce. Huawei was founded in 1987 by Ren Zhengfei, a former People's Liberation Army engineer. In just 30 years, the company has grown to become one of the world's largest producers of telecommunications and networking equipment, surpassing its U.S. rival Cisco Systems and generating upwards of $60 billion per year. Alibaba is another tale of Chinese global expansion. It is Amazon on steroids, offering some of the most far-reaching and sophisticated e-commerce services the world has ever seen. The company's founder, Jack Ma, launched the business in 1999 in order to connect Chinese manufacturers with global buyers. 17 years later, it generates more than $15 billion in annual revenues. In September 2016, the company made history when it became the largest ever listing on the U.S. stock exchange, raising $21.8 billion on its first day of trade. To put these accomplishments in perspective, consider this. IBM has been around for more than 100 years. Today, it generates upwards of $80 billion. Huawei, by comparison, grew three times as fast in only a third of the time. Other Chinese firms are moving up. Last year, 10 mainland companies made Fortune's list of the top 100 fastest growing companies in the world. 2017 will see the number grow still further. A second point. A bit later in our conversation, Jim tells me that there are times when he feels like an expat in Tokyo in the 1920s. This is reference to a time in Japan's history when it shrugged off its feudal past for an unprecedented period of growth and innovation, accompanied by an opening up to the West. Let's get back to our conversation. We'll pick it up with Jim's answering my question about the influence global brands have in China and what role they might play in influencing the policies that are affecting China today. The party is so powerful in in everybody's business in every way. Even private companies here have to do what the party wants when the party calls. And they're not all that happy about it, many of them, but they, they have to survive. So, you know, the business culture becomes very politicized. And also American companies, 
um, that are in here, Western companies in here become politicized because they got to deal with the politics of China. So that just clouds everything. And then, you know, I think the core, the core thing now is there's just this lack of trust. Uh, in fact, there's a huge lot of distrust between the countries. And I don't, I don't know how you clean that up when you've got these two very different political systems. Because um, people to people, people get along. Um, it's, a lot of this is unnecessary, but we got a, a communist party here that is, um, I think, you know, quite tainted from all the years of, 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 of bad things it won't admit. And, it, and it's done so many things of, uh, that have moved this country ahead. If they could take credit for that and admit their problems. Meanwhile, on our, in the same thing in our elections and our parties, everybody's, you know, you're looking for somebody to make your enemy and your foil. Yeah. And that's the concern as you have not rampant nationalism on both fronts. Um, and as, you know, the walls come up and people start to close down and think more about, you know, protecting their own, you create more misunderstandings and misinterpretations uh, opposed to what we had over the last 15, 20 years, which was at least trade and business relationships, business to business, which generated some element of understanding, insight and, and, and trust to some degree. But that seems to be wearing thin. Yeah. Yeah, let's hope it's temporary. I don't know. I, I mean, it's it's funny. I was um, China's overreached. I mean, China China is um, the policies have come out of this administration. Well, actually, not only this administration, but going back probably ten years or more, uh, have been very almost very blatant in they want to replace foreign companies here. And they want, and if you want to be in this market, you got to teach them how to beat you globally. I mean, if you really want to simplify it. Can you give a, an example of that? Well, they came out with Indigenous Innovation in 2006, where it was about reinnovation, co-innovation of foreign uh, technology, and then um, going and beat them, beating them uh, with national champions going global. Well, that will like Huawei. Yeah. Well, I like Huawei, but Huawei's, uh, I don't know if Huawei gets too much of a bad rap. Huawei's actually probably one of the, the more entrepreneurial companies that also has all the, it's not a state-owned company, but it gets all the benefits of state-owned company. It's quite entrepreneurial. It, it, it got slammed as the, you know, the, this, this threat, but you can turn that around and say when China's got all this technology that is foreign here, uh, shouldn't they feel the same threat? Well, Edward Snowden told them they, they, they should, and that's driven a lot of this so again that's uh, the, the technology thing is really a, a, a core a core of distrust if the u.s and china don't don't get it together and they don't get along uh the world is at risk well let's let's look forward a little bit jim i mean because you've seen this you have perspective now right and you talked about those early days and you've seen it currently um you're watching a very important shift in in the relationship between the two countries if you were to kind of flash forward uh, 10 15 years what would be your hope Versus your expectation. Oh my God! I mean, I've learned I've learned long ago never to try to predict where things are going to go in China. Much. Like yes, you what? you do it all the time, though, Chip. No, I don't. I don't <laughs> do predictions. No, no friggin' way. Yeah. Look, where could this go? This could this could go to armed conflict, mm. because if you spend all your time um, talking about all your problems are caused by outsiders, which China does, they blame all the problems on foreigners now, and Americans are at the lead of that. And in America, you you know, China's stolen all our jobs, whatever, and then you've got all the saber rattling and all the the military buildup. Um, yeah, that could go wrong. I mean, I have to admit, there's been days here where I've had the fleeting thought: Am I a, am I an expat in Tokyo in 1920, where um, you've got a militaristic government, you've got a you know huge propaganda and um, global ambitions that are driven by. Um, you know, by a paranoia. I don't, I don't think that is the case. I don't think that is the case, but you can, every now and then you get a whiff of that. Mm. You don't want it to go that way. Um, at, at the same time, remember the, uh, you know, the leadership here, all their kids went to Harvard. <laughs> right. Yeah. They, I mean, there's this kind of cross fertilization between the two countries, um, through education, through business. I mean, there is an opening. I mean, I, I'm, I'm astounded as I make the rounds and meet with clients and customers here in, in, in China on, on how much sophistication and knowledge there is of the U.S. and the outside world. That gives me hope to some degree. Am, am, am I foolish in feeling that way? Well, here's a very simple way I look at it. Um, the uh, the beauty of the world is people die. Mm. 
and um, and the and the people that the kids below them don't want to be like their parents, and you know I mean Newt Gingrich will be dead, and and um, you know this special place in hell for him and a lot of other people that have helped ruin political systems of uh, Roger Ailes, and I might even put Ru- Rupert in that category, and the same thing here with a lot of nationalists. Um, but you know the young people get along, and there's populist movements starting, so the world evolves. Mm. So I really, I really, um, I think I'm, I'm actually the Trump election has has uh, has um, of course been quite shocking and worrisome. You know, it's never good to have a personality disorder in the White House, but uh, at the same time, it's it's uh, energized a whole group of twenty somethings who would not have been involved in politics because it was frozen and it was not working. And, you know, the, the, the Clinton generation, those people all got into politics because of McGovern and, and McCarthy and anti-war. And it and energized the whole. And so my son and these young people who worked for me or distraught over this election are getting active and getting into politics. So I think that's hopeful. I think um, I look at the American political system as kind of like a drug addict sitting at the door of rehab. Your mother hates you. You spent all the family money. Um, you know you got to go in and fix it, but you're having a couple more drinks. And, you know, you know you've hit bottom when you got Trump in the White House. <laughs> So, so there's, you know, so, so the hope is once again, you know, cast back to the millennials, to, to this up and coming generation, the ones who are in many ways bonded by a common goal. It could be environmental protection, uh, climate change. Um, and, and, you know, China gets a lot of criticism and particularly out of the U.S. and elsewhere. But you kind of say, you know, they c- can be credited for staying the course or claiming they'll stay the course on, on you know, some of the climate agreements that they've, they've been signed, whether the U.S. does or not. But do you think that that's just rhetoric or do you think they actually will do that um i think that the chinese government is very serious about climate change and pollution because it's a survival issue for the party i mean when you're when you're in beijing and you uh, some days you want to just you want to just get on an airplane and go find oxygen somewhere and there's no escaping that when you got a city of 22 million people and the leadership is here and their kids and their grandkids and so they're very serious about it but it's also, uh, it took 30 years or 50 years to make it. Um, it's going to take a long time to clean it up because, again, it's about, also about jobs. And, and we've been there before. I mean, during the 1970s, I mean, you fly into L.A. and, you know, and, or Denver and there was smog everywhere. I mean, we've been through this before. We had to clean up our, our air. I mean, isn't it, isn't it allowable to simply say to China, we, they have to learn their lessons the way we did? Well, I'm kind of, you know, the, the guys that fly um, airplanes into hurricanes, I'm that way with pollution. You know, I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, which is very clean. I lived in L.A. during high pollution. Then I moved to Taipei during high pollution. I came here with high pollution. So if you hear me moving somewhere, don't go there. <laughs> it's, so even if it's back to that lake cabin, um, that's not the place. It's, it's because you just have this attraction to smog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all about the smog. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so Jim, I mean, you know, just a, a few thoughts on, I mean, it, it, you've been written on several books. So you've talked about consumers. You've talked about, you know, business uh, relationships. Um, you've been a journalist. You've been an advisor. I mean, what, what, what does the next five or six years hold for you uh, in terms of, of the time you spent here in China? Where would you put your where would you put your time and energy in terms of trying to communicate, uh, uh, the, the, you know, what, what China is trying to become and, and the role that we play in it? Oh, my, that's a complicated question. Well, I can make it more complicated if you like. (laughs) Um, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm 63 years old this year, and I just want to keep uh, what really what really motivates me now is I work with all these young people, you know, Chinese and and um, and Americans and European young people. And they're all in their early 20s, maybe 30 on the oldest. And um, they're they're so bright and hardworking and. You know, I think I'm 30 till I walk by a mirror. I just really love working with these young people and helping them get into good universities, into good law schools or graduate schools, and just working with them. They got a sense of humor, and we're all and we're all kind of righteous and trying to, um, you know, do the right thing on policy and, and change things. And hell, that's fun when you get older. You, you know, you want to work with young people. I don't want to hang out with a bunch of crabby old people. Is that part of it? I mean, having a sense of humor and living in a place like China does does that go hand in hand? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, anybody that takes themselves seriously. I, I think I've been, you know, partly being in Vietnam as, as young as I was. I've, um, um, I, well, I grew up, but also it made me think that nothing's that important anymore. 
So I don't get that rattled over anything. I, you know, I got a sense of humor about everything. And I come from a family where we, you know, we spend all our time telling jokes with each other, making fun of each other, you know, nine kids. Right. So, um, what, you know, what's, ne what's next? I'm just going to, I want to stay in the game, keep trying to figure this place out, do what I can to help. I, you know, I try to be a voice to help America understand China and China understand America without kissing ass. With just, you know, I'm very blunt in what I say and I'm fact based. I do my homework. I tell America, the American politicians, where I think they're kind of doing things. And, you know, I had a, in, in, in May, I was in the strategic and economic dialogue, which was really fun. The Treasury Department called me and asked me if I joined the CEO dialogue for the strategic and economic dialogues because the CEOs they have in there. Even though if they're getting screwed here, they go in these meetings and they talk to say how happy they are about it because they're worried about retribution in China. And, and tell that story about, about what happened and what you stood up and said. Well, we, you know, we, you, so you go in and there's six Americans, six Chinese CEOs. They're all global CEOs except for me. You know, we go down the line and you've got, um, I mean, you got the top leadership of both countries except for the presidents and premiers you had you know Wang Yang Yang Jiechir Gao Hu Cheng the the commerce minister Luo Jiwei the finance minister you had secretary of state Kerry you had secretary of treasury Lu you had USTR and all this and and then some translators and that's it so actually I don't you know I I, I have to be kind to these foreign CEOs because they they say you know they have to say nice things about China then they mention some of their problems because, um, you know, China has two sides. On one side, they got people in suits in the WTO. On the other side, they got people come in and close down your factory if they're unhappy with you. And so they have to be soft peddling their problems. So they came to me and I just said, look, I've been here 30, almost 30 years. And I was involved with all these people in AmCham who were lobbying for MFN, most favored nation, China getting in WTO. And, um, and so um, I have that base. And um, I can tell you right now that people like me, we just came back from Washington. We used to go to Washington and say, you know, let's have some reasonable policies on China because it's, a, you know, the trajectory, have some patience. We went there now and say, um, you better start pushing back on China because they've overreached and, and um, you know, basically changed the attitude of the foreign business community. And I said, this isn't, you know, this is not good for anybody because it's going to lead to trade, you know, trade wars. All, already Chinese acquisitions overseas are being blocked because they, they, you know, they, they're narrowing opportunities here, yet they're going out and buying all these technology and companies outside where those sectors are actually blocked to foreigners here. And it, it was fun because I lectured them. Mm. Um, I, and I walked them through the 90s and, you know, I said, look, I saw when it was a win-win and they, when Barshevsky and Long Yong-Tu were negotiating WTO and we were shocked at how open WTO was, but then China lost its confidence and, um, and, and started closing down. And I did say, and I, what I said to you earlier, you know, our kids get along, our businesses get along. Uh, it's the politician's fault. Mm -hmm. And you guys owe it to your grandchildren to not let this get off the rails. Yeah. And they're looking at me. It was for a kid that got expelled from high school. It was so fun to lecture the leadership of two, <laughs> yeah. two major superpowers. How did they react to that? I mean, were they just looking at you stunned? Or did they say, okay, well, that's kind of legitimate. That's fair. But, but then here you are in a closed door session. Did they engage? I think some of the Chinese officials who probably um, are fairly open-minded and knew what I was saying agreed with me, but they can't show it because this is a very repressive regime now. They're now, they, you know, they, they're, they're all scared of how they react. Wang Yang w w was very gracious. Yang Jie sure looked bored. The Kerry said, you got to listen to this guy. I, actually, where, what I saw there was the Americans were engaged. The Chinese, I think, are tired of this process and going through the motions and frankly i think they think they've got us because this is how they manage us through these various bilateral uh, engagements where it's process and it's lawyers and it's bureaucracy and they keep us busy in that way and then over on the sidelines they do whatever the hell they want and so 
the you know this election we just had with Hillary and Trump was there was going to be a reset on U.S. China trade and and business and investment because things have gone off the rails for the foreign companies, no matter who got in, and uh, even with Hillary it would have been the same. But now we have Trump, and it's you know it's it's it, he's a um, he's an unguided missile. So things needed to be need to be fixed. But if he thinks he's going to come here and do bombast art of a deal, he's not dealing with a you know a bunch of landlords on the west side he's dealing with you know these he's playing with the big boys now and they'll they'll play him like a fiddle because he'll come in here with his ego and blah 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 and they'll they'll just they'll they're, they're, they're i mean they're past master at playing manipulating foreigners especially ones with big egos who don't do their homework these guys do their homework yeah and this is the big concern isn't it because nobody would argue that things didn't need to be righted or at least to address some of the trade imbalances but it's the way that they do it it's kind of the technique and the method which is going to be either well received or entirely rejected yeah you got to be really smart when you're dealing with china you know the the, the funny thing about our trade negotiations you know we uh, our system is always having new people and especially these political appointees so you know some of them are quite good i don't want to trash them all but you'll get a political appointee who's coming here and negotiate with the chinese he may be an insurance salesman from des moines who you know contributed to the campaign and got a deputy assistant secretary title so they come in here the guy on the other side of the table has been doing this for 20 years and knows his stuff and knows what he wants they're much more professional because you know it's a, it's that's the way their system works the flexibility in our system is also quite good but when you're dealing with these guys you had better do your homework and you better know who you're talking to and 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 also you don't let don't don't get drawn into chinese culture don't say well you can't offend them you got to do this well they're going to offend the hell out of you but you know you don't you, you got to show respect but stand up for yourself and speak the truth I think that's why I've always gotten along here because the Chinese people know I, I I'm I'm a, I don't know you're a friend of China I I I like the Chinese people and I'm well intentioned but I'm not going to bullshit I'm going to tell the truth about what I see and I I don't know they keep renewing my visa so they must respect me for that or they just haven't gotten their record straight and <laughs> Jim I can see your color changing and it's probably because we're in this air conditioned environment on the 25th floor of the uh, of, of, of the hotel but we need to get you back out into the smog you need to go suck that air you need to feel like you're back in Beijing again so I want to thank you for your time fantastic insights and I wish you all the best well thanks Steve we're all friends and it's I'm, I'm glad to see you doing this podcast and I wish you the best of luck with it thanks Jim that was my interview with Jim McGregor, author, China expert, senior corporate advisor. For a link that will take you to Jim's Rat Restaurant article, for which he remains infamous at the Wall Street Journal, and for a link of the Louisville Slugger article that Jim never got to write, but maybe should have, you could find us at InsideAsiaPodcast.com. You can also find there links to Jim's two essential books, No Ancient Wisdom, No Followers, the Challenges of Chinese Authoritarian Capitalism, and One Billion Customers, Lessons from the Front Lines of Doing Business in China. InsideAsiaPodcast.com is a place where you can go to download our other episodes or sign up to get notifications of future episodes. Thanks for listening. Until next time, I'm Steve Stein, reminding you that in finance, as in life, the only quotes that matter are the ones that come from the inside.